Yo and hello everybody and this is the centralized day back with Curtis and with Sony. Hello both of you. Hello. Hi guys. So both of these guys uh, social networks are going to be included in the description. You know Curtis from my podcast uh, a lot. Sony is an investor and an entrepreneur and he's been doing that for quite a few years. When did you actually get to crypto Sony? Uh, I started investing in crypto in uh, 2013 already. Oh, wow. That's uh, yeah. jealous, jealous. Uh, so <laughs> definitely check him out. Your views tend to be the minority views. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. So very often I take the contrarian approach, which basically means that my opinion is not the most popular when I make it. And um, yeah, that's uh, how I make my profit, let's say. And so far, so good. So in 10 years time, I have an average return, compounded return of 50% annually. So I'm very pleased with that. So there you have it. There's definitely a reason to check Sony. And um, so today we are doing a, a podcast. We split into two parts. This first one I'm going to release for my channel. Uh, the second one will be uh, uh, Curtis will, uh, will release that one because he's going to be making the case in his one. Right now, I want to make uh, my case because I have some materials prepared for you to see. As you can see by the first glance on this, uh, quite a bit of love went into this, but the most of the love in this sheet is coming from Magnum Azul. He's actually uh, making a very similar uh, sheet that I have just copied, but I extended it and also I reworked quite a few of the numbers there. So. Uh, mainly, this shit focuses on the history of the stocks uh, and I extended it as far as I could have. The oldest values are from Dow Jones, then I used S&P 500 all the way to 1970, then from 1970 I switched to MSC, uh, MSCI GDP World Index and since 20, uh, 2001 I use the ASWI, that's the All Country World Index, which I think uh, the most accurately represents uh, my case, where I try to put into numbers just the world stocks. And then I calculate the yearly, uh, whether it went up or down. And then I also uh, count, just like Mark does, uh, what is the average 10 year um a movement so you know you get that uh, right now we are over the past 10 years we have been year to year average on average six percent um and but uh, the very and the 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 core of what i want to talk to you about is what actually has been doing the the money printing and the extension of the assets uh of the fed reserves of assets. So there, are, there is another column that's the assets Fed Reserve and that I've been doing since 1916. And what I do is that I compare whether the uh, Fed Reserve assets went up or down and I uh, record that change. Uh, as you can see, these uh, percent numbers next to the column to the left. And then I use those numbers to modify the value of the stocks for that particular year as to simulate inflation. This is just my way how I simulate inflation here in this sheet. And I think it's interesting for you to see. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if, yeah. uh, if, I'm, if you are following me, guys. If yeah, it's maybe clear. I'm... Okay, okay, good. This yeah. first column is uh, the, uh, the average, the 10 year average of the uh, year to year. So over the past 10 years, we are averaging 6% uh, 6 uh, increase in a stock's price. Really? But, That's low? That seems low. Yeah. Uh, when you take into consideration, when you discount the increase in Fed Reserve assets, then you actually get that we are not, over the past 10 years, that we are not actually um, going up in a stock price. And I'm going to back this up in the chart. So uh, the, the dark blue line, that's the year to year, uh, 10 year average of the stocks. And this is all the, also the reason why Mark uh, made this chart in the first place is that uh, to show that there are, there are you know, some cycles. This dark blue 
that when you discount the increase in Fed Reserve assets and the light mm -hmm. blue is just the stocks, um, uh, it's just the stocks, uh, just, uh, you know, the prices that we get. And as you can see, there is a major, major difference since 2008. And the difference is that uh, the, the, the normal stock price that we get, they dropped way less because the, the stock prices in 2009, they were saved, but only for the cost of dramatic increase in, in Fed Reserve assets. So uh, the main thing that I'm focusing on, on this chart is that um, over the past 20 years, uh, or over the past 10 years, the stock price, they seem to be in the bull uh, market where the stocks are obviously gonna go, uh, are going up since like 2009, 2008, right? Like 15 years. Um, uh, but when you discount the increase in Fed Reserve assets, it's absolutely, it's not. It's actually still, still around the zero. And you could say that it's still a bear market. And also interesting thing is also watch the gold because the gold also as Mark uh, says that tends to be inversely correlated over the past hundred years that uh, during the, the stock bear that the, the, the gold people, you know, go to safety and, and, um, and the, 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 the gold price, you know, uh, goes up, but then inversely when, when there is a, when there is a bull and, you know, people are then swapping gold for stocks and over the past 15 years, we have not really seen that much of a of a gold bear market as well. It's all it's seen here on the chart. When you see that the year to year uh, gold average was just minus five percent in 2022, and that's not really that much. When you have a look at the gold, uh, when uh, when you have a look at the gold uh, chart, uh, let's put this on monthly so we can see the perspective. Like this is not really you know that that much of a bear market and you could make a case that right now you know gold is back to bull um because well you know it's, it's breaking new all-time highs it started breaking new all-time highs in 2020 and broke it again this year i mean the last year and then when you put it into the perspective in uh, with like 80s you know the the bear in a gold was you know that was far more significant so so the mind, my main findings here from this chart is that um, the year to year average in stocks and the stock prices overall seem to be inflated and seem to be not really representing the reality. And that, you know, the current system as we have it, uh, whenever there is a problem, the Fed, you know, stimulates, prints lots of money. You know, the, 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 I think that the problem is not solved. And I promised you I'm going to back this up by one more chart. And here, here, we, here I go. Even from this chart. So, and again, this is a chart where, where you take S&P 500 and you divide it by the WM2, right? By the money supply. And you see it yourself. You see it on this chart as well. That the value of stocks is not even where it was in 1990 or 2000 we are still not even there you can see that from for instance in 2009 we dropped into the new lows but just look at the chart it, it's just sideways and it looks like it's now breaking a, a very significant level so yes even from this perspective as you can see there is a very significant level and slightly higher here this was a very significant level and it looks like it's breaking that level. So yeah, I agree that uh, 2024, even from this chart, looks like it might be um, it might be a, a pretty good bullish year actually. But yet again, like we are just trying to catch up the all-time high, and we've we've already had 20 years. So my conclusion uh, from from these findings. There is also more that my chart shows because, for instance, I added the uh, the wor world GDP. I added the world GDP uh, uh, from I added it from like 1960 or 70, 
and I'm calculating the the 10 year average and also the 10 year uh, the 10 year average change year to year and that is also kind of dropping on the GDP on the world GDP but uh, the main findings what I've noticed so far from this chart and the the case that I'm making is that the the stock prices over the past 20 years the the bull market that we are having since 2008 I think it's um putting into a simple terms it's it's cheated <laughs> it's a, it's an illusion <laughs> because um uh yeah the stocks are breaking a new all time high over the past 15 years but for the cost of decreasing purchasing power like the system we currently have the finance system we currently have i i don't think it's working <laughs> that's my okay. uh, simple mm -hmm. conclusion right right yeah i think that's that's Okay. And I think that this chart and also, you know, my uh, my year to year chart, I think that's that's my findings from that. And this leads me to another opinion that we are indeed at the end of the current uh, world's finance system. And then what's going to happen after that? Right. Like, so, of course, I can have my thesis. Again, I'm, I'm thinking that something else would happen that nobody else really sees coming because there are people that believe in the system still. Then there are another people that believe that we are going to, that okay, this, this system is going to collapse and we are going to go back to the commodity-based uh, commodity based uh, money. Uh, and that's also what the East believes and what the pro-Eastern people believe, pro-BRICS people believe, because BRICS have been preparing this. Uh, there is a chart, Felix Zulaf uh, presented it, where it clearly shows that all the gold supply went to the BRICS countries over the past mm -hmm. 10, 20 years. And also, as we know, there is a BRICS currency, BRICS currency project that is on the way and it's going to be, or as they say at least, going to be backed by uh, you know commodities. So, they have been preparing that and that's what they believe that this is going to come next but i think that none of these will and what i think that uh actually and that's also you know what what can i say i'm you know i'm in crypto so i'm with you in crypto so obviously what my opinion going to be and i think that the decentralized money is, is what's going to happen next and uh, also if that's going to be the current crypto like bitcoin and stuff I'm not sure, no, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that centralized crypto money, I think that's, that's the system. And we are, in my opinion, also looking at this chart, it's been 20 years since 20, uh, 2000. In me are, I think, at the, at the, somewhere at the change. Uh, so like the next five to 10 years. Right. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit of the space, guys. I, I've been talking a lot yeah so uh, if it's okay i want to add to what you just presented because mm -hmm. it's actually really interesting um so i also looked at the chart that you provided and you can actually do the same with bitcoin by the way <laughs> look okay. at bitcoin price in dollars versus the amount of uh, money supply and then you can see that uh, it does gain traction but actually it didn't uh, gain in the last period either but just commenting on the spx so there is, uh, there are certain people who believe we are near the end of a super cycle and I am one of those people. And when you actually consider it, I also shared uh, the link to the uh, chart in the chat. But if you take a look at the current cycle, you have a five wave Elliott wave, which basically started, this is my personal chart uh, that I believe Beautiful. is accurate. So in uh, 1929, we had a depression. Ever since, we have been booming. And as you can see, uh, the first wave ended roughly around 1980s. And then we got into a second wave, which basically ended in the dot-com. And we are currently in our last wave. And if you compare it to the, uh, to the charts that you use, then you notice that there is still room for what we call a blow off top. And that blow off top in stocks and obviously also in crypto is likely. That could basically drag us back to dot com levels, maybe higher. I don't know because I haven't compared it to the values on your chart. 
but it does give us room to move up still in a short amount of time. That basically means that we can have a, a significant up move now and our super cycle, which is roughly approximately 100 years. We are near the end of it. And that could drag those numbers, which you mentioned, we are breaking out of right now up by quite a lot in a short amount of time. And this basically overlaps because this is my main idea uh, going forward in investing in general, that we could see significant price rises in the coming period. And that would also add to your chart, taking us back perhaps beyond or around those dot-com levels. Uh, just to complement uh, what you just said, if I uh, if I uh, try to project <clears throat> the dot-com levels from where mm -hmm. we currently are, it's roughly 40%. Yet again, uh, you have to remember that this is under the condition that there is not going to be increased the money supply. If the yeah. money supply increased, then it's then then the stocks in it's if we done. are to get here, then it's gonna be more than forty percent. But and forty percent from uh, where we are, it's a uh, four thousand and seventy plus forty percent. Uh, that would be six and a half thousand actually. Yeah, on this dot com level. Yeah, so that that's really a very aggressive move. The question is, how long does this final wave? which basically started at the 2008 uh, big financial crisis. How much further can we go? And we can go until the 2030s, in my opinion. So we still have, at best, we still have six years to go. And we don't know how much money printing versus stock appreciation we will see. Uh, if you look at your chart, uh, stocks uh, have been flat, uh, as you mentioned uh, at the start. So the performance of those stocks eh, at the very right side has been flat. So there is significant upside to be seen. So my general idea is, will we see it in a short amount of time very aggressively, which people like to call blow off top? Or will we see significant rises uh, and, and not a lot of printing in the next five to six years? Uh, both are um, yeah, basically uh, able to occur. I don't know which one will occur, but I have been projecting personally that the SPX uh, could move to 5,600 or to 6,130, which is roughly my bull target. Uh, and that would take us near those levels. Um, so I find it high, highly interesting because it complements your charts that we are in a breakout. Yeah, and it's also nice when you when we can draw similar conclusions by uh, diversified methods, like each of us in a different way. Uh, yeah, that's valuable. Uh, anything um, you would like? So, to So, Sunny, you're saying by 2030, between now and 2030, so six year window, we hit an S and P of like 6,500 at at the top. I so my personal opinion is that I cannot know when this will end and how. So I basically use the structure you see here, which is basically the macro super cycle for the SPX. Now people have been calling it top for years, so I won't do that. Uh, but when I look at current market conditions and I extrapolate my projections on them, then I see a medium term target, which I just mentioned, 5,600 to 6,130. Uh, will that happen this year? That could be in the form of a blow off top. But it could also be that markets just grow gradually over the next couple of years because the economy does stay strong, as something you said as well. And we move upwards uh, for a little longer. Uh, that's also a possibility. And I'm not certain which will play out, but those targets that I have do right. add up to um, more upsides on Dave's uh, chart as well. Eh? The first chart he showed with the stocks that they appreciate and the second chart that he shared uh, that also shows that versus the money supply, we still uh, are breaking out upwards. So both of those are supported by this one as well. And right. this is my leading macro idea because as you can see so far, guys, we've been in a bull market for only 11 years. And on generally, bear markets last, uh, it's, it's, it's mentioned there, uh, a lot um, shorter than bull markets, but bull markets tend to last 
um, uh, roughly 18 to 20 years, depending on how you count. And we right. have only had a short impulse since 2013 so far. So there is still a lot of room to move. I think Dave, his chart also shows that. Um, and that's also basically my opinion on uh, what's next. But that's not a blow off in my mind. That's like 15% over the next two years. That's hardly a, even on the chart, it doesn't look like much of a spike at all, right? So yeah. I thought you were talking about something really, really like parabolic. Is that not correct? Uh, yeah, but that's my, I'm, I'm always conservative in my targets because yeah. uh, I prefer uh, playing with a set of rules, in my case, Fibonacci. And I believe that, yeah, 6,130 sure. is a would be just 15% this year and 15% 2025 and you're already at 6,100. Yeah, which is yeah. fairly likely. Or it could occur this year alone as well. And then it yeah. would be a parabola when we see 35% after a strong year as well. Right. I think people think about printed money is money in circulation in the economy that does not consider the velocity of money, right? How yeah. frequently it's moving, which is equally as important, right? You can have a ton of money in the system, but it's locked into, uh, let's say, uh, wealthy hands and it's not being spent into the economy because there's low incentive and you have a very poor Look at Russia, right? There's a lot of wealth in Russia, but the economy, the, the velocity of money is probably quite low because yeah. you have corruption and you have war and all these things. So just because there's money that exists does not mean it's actually affecting the business cycle, right? And we're talking about that. If we're talking about valuing stocks, for example. Um, you need the money to be circulating. So velocity is as important as the amount of dollars that are theoretically in the market, right? Uh, the S&P is at 4750, yet when you consider the money supply in quotations or M2, it's actually not that high. And it's you need to see things through that lens. You know, looking at um, what you were saying about um, stocks going higher uh, in price in nominal terms, this is quite a different question of whether it's actually increasing your purchasing power. And to do that, to, to calculate that, it's related to what David said, is you have to look at how much money is in circulation and the, the price index, right? And my point was that the, there's a difference between the money supply and the price of things. They tend to correlate because as the money supply increases, there's more dollars chasing the same amount of goods. Um, and one other point I'll make is, is people will talk about uh, the price is going up, but you're not always buying the same item. So if you look at a car in 1970, maybe it was $5,000. Let's say a BMW was $5,000 in 1970. But today's BMW is much more expensive, of course. But you're also getting a much better product. Uh, the same thing with houses. People talk about how expensive houses are. But houses in the 1950s were basically one room. Maybe you had insulation. Maybe you had drainage. Maybe you had a porch. Uh, it, hardly what you're seeing these days when you say a house or a single home residence, there's all sorts of built-in inflationary items like safety checks, better electricity, better insulation, yeah. larger houses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you do have to be careful when you compare apples and oranges, things like cars and houses. The world is getting better and better. People are getting wealthier, at least uh, wealthy people are getting better lives. There's a lot of gains in terms of productivity, technology, but you don't always see it and you can't always see it in the price level. That would be a little bit of a pushback against this idea that there's not progress being made. Um, but definitely you do need to understand the difference between um, a nominal GDP and a real GDP. And of course, the difference is the, the price level. Um, you, know, you, you discount the price level out of that and you can see... Um, and I think you're right, David, that they do, they, I think your argument, they kind of, they uh, wallpaper over the problems by just driving up money supply and saying, okay, we fixed that because we printed $2 trillion. And it's a bit, it can be a bit of a, um, a way that politicians try to hide the, the rot in the system. And, uh, you know, definitely we will have uh, rec days of reckoning where some of these things are shown to not have been fixed in the first place. Yeah. So there's a lot of agreement there.
Sony is a technical guy. He's been you know looking at charts uh, all his life. So Sony, you know, you can also share. Imagine that we go to the all-time high, and then we can we just uh, go down because also the last time we were on this level, there was a 50% drop. How many twin twin top charts have you seen, and how bearish are they? <laughs> <laughs> just just before you answer that that that's the dot com blow off right this yeah. is the yes this is the 20 yes this is 2000 yeah. yes so, right so i don't think that is what you would call a sustainable reference point how would this look like to you sony if you look at it from a, uh, a technical perspective so personally what i see is that yeah you guys see it as well we just broke out to a new high so that everyone can see that there was a lot of resistance below and we broke higher but generally eh, generally like also like curtis says the dot com peak was an extreme also in emotions so chances are that if we move to that level we initially at least get a rejection because we're open towards a new triangle an ascending triangle if you if you connect the lows from 2009 to the ones of 2021 uh, and you draw a line to the right side, that line goes up. And obviously you have, uh, it's a it's a median line, so you have deviations upwards or downwards, whatever. But should we move up, I assume we also move down after that, because uh, if something like your chart that you have drawn occurs, that would be an unsustainable move, in my opinion. Uh, but once again, as as, uh, as, as Christian Slaw also said, uh, this is all predicting what yeah. may happen yeah. in the this future. This is just one of the know. cases. Because, because there has been uh, an, an insane amount of printing since 2008. Um, there has been a, a totally different situation in the past 20 years. And we cannot um, talk about second and third order consequences to things which are still playing out right now. Anybody wants to ask anything more before we just we can just wrap myself up? I just want to make a little uh, note on top of this uh, to end it all. Like if you zoom out and you look at the dot com, you have to take into account that this, uh, like Curtis also says, is a peak. Uh, this is also peak emotion in uh, in, in human behavior. And um, psychology tends to play out over time. That's also why I personally believe in things like macro cycles. People, they love to focus in on daily or on weekly price patterns. But I've, um, yeah, basically also with the chart you showed, Dave, I personally believe that we have to zoom out more and look at secular bulls and secular bears and uh, look at the bigger picture. And as soon as you start doing that, things become a lot more clear uh, which way we are heading and what could occur. So that's something I want to add. Uh, people are unique, but our behavior in markets is on repeat. Uh, that's why I also like to be a contrarian because it plays out every time. And uh, yeah, so far I haven't been proven too much wrong uh, in my career. So um, I'm eager to see what happens. And I'll just add in as well. You're talking about a very like we're talking about much longer time periods here. And technical analysis on a, a, a five minute chart or a six months is very different than what it is from 1981. And yeah. who uh, in 1981, who, what were people like? How did they think? What was the global population? And what was the composite? What's companies like in 2001 blow off? What companies were in the stock market? Very different than today, right? The yeah. tech companies in, in 2001 did had nothing but URLs. They were dot coms. They had nothing. The tech companies of today have a billion users. You know, comparing Google to uh, you know uh, pets.com, it's it, it's it's not. You're not even comparing the same thing. So, <laughs> to me, to, I I respect technical analysis. I think it tells you what happened, in a, and it, it, a useful data point what happened and what is happening. It's also useful because it does capture sentiment, right? And it cap and you can make money on that. I do think yeah. it does almost nothing to predict the future in the sense of things that change. You know, a simple thing would be AI, right? Like if you yeah. believe AI is actually going to take over the world, you, this chart becomes irrelevant. 
And if you look at crypto charts, I mean, what Bitcoin just hit its 15 year anniversary, but on a, a longer time scale, they're irrelevant in terms of economic history or the last 200 years. The charts don't matter. What matters is, are we getting adoption or not? And if we are, we're going much, much higher. If we're not, we're going much, much lower on a, a five year window, right? Um, and so you can have your analysis dwarfed by real things that change in the world, right? It's sort of uh, when I mentioned re reflexivity in my Twitter feed this week, I was trying to refer to that of basically sentiment will then have these milestones where everything changes completely. And suddenly you have ETFs with Bitcoin or you have people using Ethereum day to day or you have DeFi that actually starts having, you know, uh, um, long bonds that you can hold irrespective of banks. I don't know if you um, read the books from Charlie Munger, uh, Dave or Curtis, but Charlie Munger's idea of investing is the same. He just uses various principles from mathematics to physics to uh, finance, whatever, and he combines them. And I think if you do that, uh, you, you, buy, uh, you use psychology, you use TA, you use fundamentals, and you also use other things uh, which are outside of uh, basic uh, economics and you combine them, then you have a very good uh, gauge in general uh, of what could occur. And that's a good approach, I, I agree. Yeah, I yeah. also believe that the combination of DA and FA is the best way to go. 100%. So, and with that, I should wrap up and I'm wrapping up my uh, podcast with Sony and uh, Curtis. So thanks a lot, guys. I hope to uh, make another one with you uh, and, and maybe with Mark as well. But uh, I hope to see you soon again. And we're going to continue uh, on Curtis's channel um, with the podcast where Curtis is going to make the case. So uh, see you soon there.